morning. One of the most familiar verses after John 3.16 for Christians is Romans 8.28, isn't it? But this morning we're going to look at verse 29 as well. It's called context. And it's very important that we understand the context of Romans 8.28. So look at it, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So all things work together for good. Let's all pray that God would open our hearts. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your word, the privilege to open it together. And I pray that each of us now will listen and learn push aside life's distractions and frustrations and seek to hear directly from you through your precious word. We believe in its power. And Lord, we are thankful that we have the Holy Spirit to guide us in truth and that we have your preserved word. And now, use it. Work miracles in every heart. And we ask this in the name of our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We know now, the Bible was written so that we could know many things, amen? It wasn't written so that we could wander around hoping, am I saved? Am I going to heaven? No, God wrote his word so that we could know some things. And, of course, the most important thing that we would know, 1 John 5, 13, these things have been written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. God wants all of us to know that we are saved. That we're born again. Then after we're saved, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 12, Paul said, I know whom I believe, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto me against that day. We should know not only that we are saved, but that we are kept by God's power, that we are preserved in Jesus Christ. Then we can know many other things. We can know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen? 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of, of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God wants you to know some things. And one of the things he wants us to know here in verse 28 is that all things work together for good. It's easy to just see the phrase and say the phrase, but to truly understand the phrase is really important for Christians. Because our response to trials, to attacks, is often not what it's supposed to be. And when it isn't, it means we really don't believe this true. That all things work together for good. They do. But to who? To them that love God. To them that love God. So this verse isn't for the unsaved, is it? This verse is for Christians that love God. And God promises that all things will work together for good. If you go to Genesis 50, one of the people that had learned this truth was Joseph. Most of us know the story of Joseph. And did he go through some intense trials? Absolutely. Think, think about it. Have any of us ever been sold into slavery? He was. Have we ever ended up in prison based on a false accusation? No, he did. We're talking years and years. And after all that was finished, he was unjustly sold into slavery. He was unjustly put into prison. After it was all finished, and he finally was reunited with his brothers, who were so afraid because he had so much power as a second command to Pharaoh that he was going to punish them for what they had done to him. Look what he said here in Genesis 50, verse 20. But as for you... Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. God meant it unto good. Now here's someone who's been through the fire. Amen? Unjust, uh, being sold, unjustly going to prison. 
And for him to look back on all that and say, God meant it unto good. Because look now, God's put me in a place where I can literally save thousands of lives by warning Pharaoh about the coming famine. Which they did, and they prepared, and set food aside, and when the famine came, they were ready. God meant it unto good. And then go to Psalm 119. David is another example. I'll just give these two examples this morning of, of people that had learned this truth. And this is a truth that we have to learn. It's not a truth that we instantly believe the day we're saved. Because our flesh just resists it, doesn't it? When the trials come, where our initial response is typically anger or frustration. We have to learn this truth when the trials come to respond. Yes, God knows what he's doing. Yes, God has a purpose in this. No, I'm not going to get angry at God. No, I'm not going to complain. No, I'm not going to moan. Something we have to learn. David learned it. Verse, uh, Psalm 119, look at verse 71. Everybody was staring because it's such a long chapter. And they're wondering, where are we? Uh, sorry about that. So Psalm 119, verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. You know, we often think of David, a man after God's own heart, a man to become the greatest king of Israel. Wait a minute. David had to hide in caves. David's life was threatened many, many times by Saul. And then his children rebelled, tried to steal the kingdom away. David had gone through the fire as well. And it, reflecting back, and when, when he wrote this through the Holy Spirit, he said, it is good for me that I've been afflicted. So it's one thing to say, yes, I understand the phrase, and yes, I believe it's true. It's another thing to learn it and live it, isn't it? That all things work together for good. And here we have two examples of people that had gone through intense trials. For, for many, many of us, worse trials than we've ever faced. And to reflect back and say, it was good for me. It was good. Because God is good. But it's, it's for them that love God. And this is important this morning. So go to 1 Corinthians 2, 9. And, and we got to understand this morning that we are commanded to love God. We all understand that. It's the greatest commandment in the Bible, right? To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But we should love God because he first loved us. And gave us his son. Gave us eternal life. Remember, love is what we do. But notice 1 Corinthians 2, 9. As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither been into the heart of man, the things which God had prepared for them that, what? Love him. For them that love him. And then look at James chapter 1, verse 12. We'll see it again. It's easy to pass over these phrases sometimes about loving God. Do we love God? And by that, I mean, do we show that love through our acts of obedience. Because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. James 1.12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he has tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. All things work together for good to them that love God. And so when we respond improperly to our trials and attacks, because we're not in a right fellowship with the Lord. We're not loving Him with our lives. We're probably living in disobedience. And so the Holy Spirit isn't in control of our lives, and so we don't have the capacity to respond as we should. But God wants us to. He wants us, like Joseph, to learn to respond like they did and say, this was good. It seemed not good at the time. It was painful, but it's good. And to be able to say that, that's called Christian maturity. So verse 28, we know, praise God, we know this is true. For Christ God told us so. And that's all we need. That all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. 
I don't want to get into a discourse about predestination. But if you're saved this morning, God called you. God called you to be saved. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 7, and we'll see this. There was a time in your life when the Holy Spirit literally reached into your heart and called you to be saved. And you responded with yes. Hallelujah. Romans 1, 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saved. You've been called according to his purpose. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we should be praising God every day that we were called. And we responded to that call, and we were saved. And for those that have responded, and those that have been called according to his purpose, we can know that all things work together for good to them that love God. <laughs> One more on the being called. 1 Peter 5.10, if you would turn there. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. Notice it says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strength, and settle. We will come back to this verse later, but it says, Called unto his eternal glory. So we know, we can know this morning, we can know confidently because God said so that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the call, according to his purpose. We're all called, or we wouldn't be here. And hopefully we're loving God through our obedience to his commands. But God then gives us some context in verse 29. That he is ultimately working in our lives as his children to conform us. Notice it says, for whom he did foreknow, that's us, he also did predestinate to be what? Conform to the image of his son. This helps us to understand this great truth, all things work together for good, because now we can see that if there is something that God brings into our life that seems at the time maybe out of place or a surprise, painful, whatever, we can realize why is it good? Because God is using it to conform me. Now, when you conform something, it takes pressure, isn't it? That's just the fact. It takes pressure to conform something. If you want to reshape something, if you want to conform it, it takes pressure. That's why we can believe that, yes, this trial is good. Because all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So... What God is telling us, if you go to Romans chapter 5, is that whatever God allows in our lives, and it's not just trials, it's everything that he allows in our life, the people that he allows in our life, circumstances, our jobs, whatever, all of it is part of what God is using to conform us. It works on us. Romans 5, look at verse 3. And not only so... But we glory in tribulations also. <clears throat> now how can we glory in tribulations? Back to Romans 8.28. Because we know that it works together for good. But look at the next verse. Knowing that tribulation worketh. You see that word work? That's a verb, isn't it? That's saying that tribulations actually do something in our lives. They work in our lives. And that's how God conforms his children. Now don't, don't be surprised if the devil and the world are also trying to conform you at the same time. That's why Paul tells us in Romans 12 too, be not conformed to this world 
world is constantly trying to say, no, I want you to, I want you to be conformed to my image. I want you to be more like me, the world says. <clears throat> and God says, no, I'm trying to conform you to my image. I want you to be more like me. Now, look at 2 Corinthians 4. We'll see it again. But we need to understand this morning that all things work together for good is as practical as it gets for Christians when it comes to understanding that God has conformed us. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. It says, For which cause we think not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, wait for it, here comes that word again, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way of life. There's that word for it again. Here we have two passages where we're told that trials or afflictions or tribulations work for us. And that's how we can know that all things work together for good because God is using whatever he brings into our life to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Look at another one, 1 Peter 5.10. 1 Peter 5.10, which we looked at briefly earlier. From the cold point of view, but now I want us to look at it from the trials point of view <clears throat> and the conforming point of view. First Peter 5.10, but the God of all grace, but called you into his eternal world by Christ Jesus. Look at this next phrase. After that you've suffered a while. Make you what? Perfect. Conforming, perfecting, they're the same thing. God is conforming us, God is perfecting us, God is working to make us more like Jesus. Conform to the image of his son. And this says, after that you suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. That's a lot of things that, that suffering can do, isn't it? It says it can perfect us, it can establish us, it can strengthen us, and it can settle us. The suffering. Tribulation works patience. The tribulation worketh a far more exceeding and eternal way of glory. So now we understand what God means when he says all things work together for good because God is using all things to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. So go to 1 John 2, 6 now if you would. And we'll see that this is what God is after. He wants us to be like Jesus. And because we are stubborn rat bags, it takes a lot of work. Amen? To conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. This is the fact. We get saved and praise God we're going to heaven and we're a child of God, but we're not walking like Jesus. We've got a long way to go. First John 2 says, He that saith he abideth himself on himself also so to walk even as he walked. So God wants to conform us. Who we love, who we live for, what we delight in, what we talk about, what our goals are. We could go on and on, couldn't we? God wants to conform us. He wants us to be like Jesus. Conformed to the image of his son. So first he makes us his child, doctrinally, the instant we get saved, we're children of God, hallelujah. But now he's going to take the rest of our Christian life to start conforming and changing and making us more like Jesus. That's how we can know all things work together for good. Because it's all part of God's conforming process. To believe otherwise is to say either that God doesn't understand or can't keep up. You know, that all these trials, just, there's too many, and he, they, they catch him by surprise. Well, we all know that's silly. God knows everything. He knows every detail in our lives. He even knows how many hairs are on our head. The Bible says he even knows how many steps we've taken. He knows everything about us. So when that trial comes, God already knew Matter of fact, God allowed it. Why? Because he's conforming us. 
So the next time the trial comes, or maybe you're in the middle of one, don't get angry. Don't get frustrated. Don't beg God to take it away tomorrow. Just thank God that he's working in your life to conform you. And Lord, I know this is all part of the process. I know you know what you're doing, and I know you know why you're doing it. And I may never completely understand, but I can know that you will always do what's best for me. That's the perspective we need to have. We can know this, that all things work together for good. We can know it. But to actually know it practically takes time. It takes years. Talk to someone that's been saved 40 years. They're going to tell you, I'm not there yet. God's still conforming me. God's still working in my life. Talk to someone that's been saved 50 years. They're going to say the same thing. None of us has ever met a Christian that says, that's it. God's done. I'm just like Jesus. There's no more rough edges for God to polish off. I'm perfect. This doesn't happen, does it? Which means there's more things that God needs to bring into our life to work together for good that we might be conformed to the image of His Son. Why is it going to all this trouble? We're going to heaven anyway. Amen? He's doing it for us. He, want, he created us initially to fellowship with Him and to please Him. Amen? To bring Him glory. Jesus came and said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Obey me. Well, we naturally don't want to. We naturally want to disobey because we're rebels. We're sinners. So this is good for us. It's preparing us for heaven and it's also bringing us closer to the Lord each time. Every little rough edge he polishes off, every little change he makes in our lives brings us closer to the Lord, sweeter fellowship with our Creator, and again, back to why we were originally created. Fellowship with our Creator, which we will get to enjoy for eternity. Amen? He created us for that. And once we get to heaven, we're not going to look back and say, Lord, I... I wish you wouldn't have had that trial in my life. No, we're going to look back and Paul's going to say, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We're just going to say, thank you, Lord. You knew what you were doing. I didn't understand it, but you knew. And we're just going to thank you. So it's one thing this morning to say, I know this is true. It's another thing to be like Joseph and be like David and say, I know this is true in my life. Because I can look back and I can see this and I can see this trial and I can see how God used it for good in my Christian life to conform me to the image of His Son. It's all about our response, isn't it? Count it all joy, James said. When you fall into garbage, Peter said, rejoicing that you're counted worthy to suffer. Let's learn to truly rejoice and respond as God would have us to and say, I know. I know that all things work together for good for them that love God. Amen? Right. Dear Lord, we are grateful.